Great, thank you. Uh, welcome to what I think is the only panel at this summit that brings together the brick and mortar physical world that we all live in and the tech and information worlds that we mainly talk about. So what I hope we can do in the next few minutes is uh, look a little bit at where they intersect or where they don't, where they should connect more, or whether maybe they should connect less, uh, which I think is part of the point of the provocative and remarkable exhibition Rem Koolhaas did at the Venice Biennale this year, which is still on if anyone's going to Venice, called The Elements of Architecture, which looked at very, very basic things in architecture to try to, I think, reinforce a sense of physicality again. Um, we have a very short video really sh that just gives you a very fast overview of it. Maybe we'll show it now and then we'll begin conversation. If we could. Architecture is a very ancient art. Each architect is got by definition is schizophrenic. One leg in 5,000 year old history, the other leg in the kind of present. And that means technology and that means the digital. Uh, my obsession with elements has been to focus, to, to assert that elements such as the elevator, the escalator have never really been incorporated in either the ideology or the theory of architecture. And that now with the new digital kind of intersections, digital hybrids, digital combinations, uh, the risk is that architecture is simply incapable of thinking of its entire repertoire. And, and that is what I hope will be one of the outcomes of this uh, uh, exhibition. Okay, we, now, now it's time for you to finish the sentence. Uh, um. Basically, what I was uh, trying to do is to, <coughs> uh, to address the issue that uh, architecture, uh, but also city planning and also the making of cars, is kind of really about to change fundamentally uh, to the kind of intersection with the digital world. Uh, and that process is taking place uh, under the influence of a lot of the thinking uh, here, but it's taking place alone and, and not in combination or not in collaboration with the domains that you influence. And so I wanted to kind of really show that, uh, for instance, the notion of the fireplace is deeply influenced by what Tony has done in Nest, but that the uh, condition of the floor is changing that the ceiling is changing. And I wanted to kind of really uh, create a situation that instead of surrendering blindly to these kind of forces, we can actually begin to collaborate. And in the collaboration, perhaps also question some of the uh, directions that are being uh, uh, generated. Good. Uh, Tony Fidel, who founded Nest, uh, is, I think, one of the great uh, I will say creators, because I pledge not to use the word innovators one more time today. <laughs> one of the great creators in Silicon Valley. Uh, I know you guys have talked before, because you, you actually, at, in Venice, did a long, a long conversation, uh, which was somewhat oppositional. Uh, today, Rem, you're talking about collaboration. What, what has changed, I, I, other than the fact that you're in the turf of Tech. No, no. Actually, actually, it was always uh, about collaboration. Okay. So uh, there is no, there is no opposition. Uh, I think it's it's interesting how basically in each profession there is a position embedded, whether you want to or not. Right. And this is what I was saying. You know, you, if you're an architect, you by definition uh, have to care about legacy. You have to care uh, by definition about the past and about history. Uh, that doesn't mean you're a technophobe. Uh, I think that all those uh, things can be uh, uh, can happen in close collaboration, uh, but uh, the collaboration without the collaboration, I think that you risk uh, uh, going in uh, a kind of tangent uh, without, uh, let's say, the, the interaction or the interface with some parts of the real world, and, and we risk simply uh, being left behind. Exactly. Yeah, when, we, when we look at when we look at technology today being brought in, 
it's really retrofitted into buildings. Right. It's, it, it, we're not designing buildings around it or with it really right. involved. You know, now we do it, when we brought in electricity, it was always tacked on back yeah. in the late right. 1800s, right. right? And now well, it's or, integrated into or, the or even, or even inside plumbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Same plumbing, thing. all of right. those things right. were integrated over time. Sure. We're now at that next phase where we're taking these other things, such as what we're building at NAST or other companies, and now starting to think and collaborating to, to really make it part of the architecture so the computing is not in your face and these kinds of sensors are not in your face. They actually recede into the structure itself and make the structure better, not just be this tacked on. So you think the, the NEST is really a sort of uh, intermediate generation? Well, I, I hope so. Okay. I hope there's going to be a lot more evolution. Mm -hmm. When I look at you know, the arcane way of some, how these different systems work together, mm -hmm. they're really not modernized at all. It's because no one really thought about these two worlds colliding. And so what's really been for us is, is now talking to architects and talking to system designers and, and plumbing and equipment manufacturers, and, and they're learning about our world, and they have lots of questions, just like we had in Venice. There's a lot of questions that we have to answer on both sides to be able to learn about each other, to be able to make these integrations happen. But it's going to take a long time. If I were to take your comment about collaboration literally and say, OK, you know, I'm building a new building, and I want to commission the firm of Coolhouse and Fidel to design it, <laughs> what would it look like? Where would we be going with it? How would it be different from the buildings we know? I, I think the beauty uh, of what he is doing or, or what they are doing is, is that it's not necessarily defining a new look, uh, okay. but it's kind of defining a new performance. And uh, therefore, uh, it simply adds another layer of intelligence. Uh, and to the extent, uh, I think that oppositional is the wrong way, but uh, word, but yes, I'm critical of certain aspects. I'm critical of the kind of relentless uh, profit motive that uh, kind of seems to uh, invade or characterize uh, almost every one of the new inventions, and therefore kind of suddenly introducing in architecture uh, a domain or a question that never was there uh, before. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is really the, the, the one area where I'm critical. I'm also critical uh, in the sense that, uh, of the arguments. I think more, maybe the two are connected, maybe it is because the, criti the profit motive is so important. More and more uh, inventions are sold because they support security, increase security, right. they increase comfort, and they increase sustainability. And, uh, that was your new trinity, you yeah, said the in the essay trinity. you wrote. Yes. And I was basically saying, you know, my generation was uh, interested in the notion of uh, egalité, fraternité, and the French Revolution. And now we are stuck uh, with comfort, sustainability, <laughs> and security. And I'm not necessarily finding that a kind of great change. Well, is that really <laughs> less an architectural change than a change in the, the social uh, mores of the time that we have moved Clearly, from, yeah. from a sense of the common good to a sense of the private good. Yeah. Clearly. And yeah. architecture inevitably reflects a society's values more than it actually shapes them, mm -hmm. I think. Is it? For better or for worse, yeah. it, it, it seems to. Tony? Well, I, I, I think that you know, if we look at what's going on in homes today, obviously it's about the home first. Yeah. But if you can actually get people engaged with some of these new systems, getting engaged and learn about mm -hmm. their homes. To, to, today, a lot of people come to us and say, well, yeah, I feel like I have to always take care of my home. Why do I always have to take care of it? There's a leak here. Or this is, needs to get fixed. Why can't the, the system tell me before things fail so that I can, we can be proactive about it as opposed to it's broken and now we don't have hot water at two in the morning or something like that. So we're looking at also bringing freedom back into the home for homeowners. So I think there's a, there's a gentle balance yeah. here. Um, but you, it does start really selfishly by the homeowner and the people who live in it. But hopefully with information and these kinds of systems, they can learn about the community around them and be able to do, have larger impact through the, the information we can provide through these systems. So it really is about the physical systems within a structure. That we're I mean, Nest certainly is that. Well, well our goal is really to yeah. take the things that are already around us that mm -hmm. have been unloved for years and, and literally reinvent them so they give you that information and make you part of the community. So we have a, a, a rolling total of all the energy that was saved by all of our customers, and it's been two and a half billion kilowatt hours. 
already in just less than three years. And so people start to see and they can see why they've used more or used less, and then they can start to make conscious choices. We're not trying to, we're not trying to be judgmental saying you have to turn it down. We're just giving them the information, just like the quantified self, we're doing the quantified home in a way to allow people to make better choices if they so choose. I like my nest just because it looks so beautiful. <laughs> and there's I, another I, reason for I, it I well. don't really, I mean, it's great if it saves energy, although that's not why I have it. I have it because the, the, uh, that old Honeywell thermostat was one of the ugliest things I'd ever seen, <laughs> actually. So, um, if, uh, let's talk about technology in a different part of the building process. Why is the process of actually making buildings so slow? Uh, you know, the, you can have, let's, we can envision the most wired house, the house with nests up the wazoo, the house that, with every other tech uh, thing we're capable of creating today. It still probably took two years to build. Why has technology not made inroads into the way in which the thing itself, the architecture itself is made? Well, from what I've experienced by building homes, yeah. uh, was really... Yeah, you, you can, speak, you you can speak as a client now if you yeah, want. Yeah, well, I, 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 I wanted to do a prefab house. Okay. I wanted to do a prefab house. I wanted to do it exactly the way we wanted it. It was going to come off of a manufacturing line. But then what happened was we wanted to make a few changes. It wasn't going to be the exact house we wanted. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we couldn't make the changes was because the building codes in every single jurisdiction around the U.S. are different. And we fight that every day with Nest. There's all these little arcane rules for us to be able to sell our products mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. each thing. That that whole governmental you know, uh, legislation goes around and stifles the innovation for architects, for manufacturers to do prefabbed homes or even the systems inside of homes. And then you have the whole contractor organization who wants to just do what they've always been doing because they don't want to learn about new, th a lot of them don't want to learn about new things. So all of these things come together to really stifle innovation, at least I've seen it from a customer perspective. <clears throat> my, my answer would be different. I think that the architecture is both uh, ancient and slightly absurd. Because what we do, we, we design prototypes. Mm -hmm. We design prototypes for things that will never go into production. And we uh, therefore design a chain or a sequence of completely unique uh, buildings, completely unique definitions that are addressing unique contexts, unique programs, unique people. So we are in the business of creating uniqueness. And that is, of course, very beautiful because almost everything all seems to be kind of on the way to be normative, repetitive, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But basically, if you do a prototype, you have to be careful, you have to test things, and that's why it takes long. The architecture yeah. is, in its very essence, sort of bespoke, we could say. Yeah, I would say so, yeah. It, it, for us, and, from the technical world, we say it's always in beta. Yeah. It's, it's, always always in, be, it's always in beta. It never finally ships. Yeah. Yeah. It's, right. it's a, live, a live piece. But if it remains that way, how will we ever solve any of the problems that we, we would like architecture to solve, even as it also creates extraordinary aesthetic experiences mm -hmm. and profound spaces for us. We also want to house more people. We want to make day-to-day -day life more pleasurable for more people with better roofs over their heads or even some roof over, your, over their heads. Uh, how is this compatible with that? Uh, I think that you're, you're confusing uh, political issues or okay. economic issues with uh, architectural issues. I think there are parts of the world where architecture really provides an amazing service to unbelievable amounts of uh, uh, human beings. Uh, ironically, maybe you don't live in one of those uh, parts of the world, and neither do I. Uh, and, and that is why, uh, of course, uh, major and, and important architectural initiatives are taking place now in Asia, in, in right. countries that, that we are remote from. And that is why you know, I personally have been making every effort to be involved in those countries, whatever uh, ideological kind of issue <clears throat> one might have with it. But uh, I think it's unfair to say that architecture is so slow that it cannot accommodate uh, uh, speed, because for instance in China it is accommodating uh, amazing speed. You were one of the very first people to become engaged mm. with the question of the mega city, as mm. I recall, and, and its implications uh, around the world, which you did 10 or more years ago, 
10? Uh, uh, 20. 50. 50. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, came, yeah. I came to New York uh, in the 70s to, to understand kind of really, really what the mega city was and to uh, understand how different the mega city was from what we uh, collectively were still cherishing as the model of the city, i.e. something well composed, coherent, with beautiful uh, dimensions and, and proportions uh, and an overview. Uh, I think that if I have any merit, uh, it is that I was able to describe something much wilder, uh, much more chaotic, uh, much more kind of random and arbitrary, uh, still as uh, a kind of defensible and interesting uh, organism and uh, an interesting support for culture. Well, Delirious New York is uh, uh, the, what you're referring to, I think, which is your book that is really now a classic uh, and was 40 years ago, I think. Um, but I was joking. Uh, no, but it was, it was pretty close, but it was, it was almost, yeah. wasn't, it, wasn't it the late yeah. 70s yeah. that that yeah. came out, yeah. I think? So it was almost 40 years ago. Um, were you, in effect, saying that, the, that New York was the first meta city, me, you know, uh, not, mega city? Not really, yeah. but okay. I, I simply took New York and, and because it was convenient, it's limited, uh, it, it's def de defined. Uh, and, and, and used it as a kind of prototype of a condition that I was anticipating would work, w would be more and more ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. Because the, the scale of the mega cities around the world now makes New York look like San Francisco mm -hmm. by, yeah. by comparison, yeah. it, would, yeah, absolutely. it would seem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Rem, do you, do you see any real differences in, in, in your projects when they're in China versus India or, or some of the other things that yeah, you're doing? Uh, uh, Ooh, yeah, in, yeah. Interactions with the government or something? I, I think the, the, uh, 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 my, my final conclusion, uh, and it's kind of really, uh, it surprised me myself, is that the most important uh, kind of difference in architecture today is the age of people that decide. Basically, in, in China, the decision maker is 35. Uh, mm -hmm. In uh, uh, Europe, uh, the decision maker is kind of 55. In uh, America, the decision maker in many cases is a trustee and therefore kind of even, even older. And I think that age is kind of really a clearly uh, correlation between age and, and appetite for risk. Uh, and so for me, the, the ultimate uh, difference is what Adventure, what amount of adventure, uh, what about amount, which amount of change are particular societies willing to engage with? Yeah. So do you think the old city that we were talking about, that, that you wrote about in Delirious New York, that the, the, the coherent, well, the coherent city that you referred to before is, is merely a sentimental uh, no. attraction at this point? No. Oh, no, no, okay. <laughs> I, uh, I think that um, I'm a European and therefore I, uh, of course, I love European cities. But I became aware early that there is a kind of implied, uh, a considerable shift uh, going on. Uh, and, and we've seen it, whether you call it globalization or mm -hmm. mobilization or the uh, awakening of China or the kind of shift of economic activity in the world. and that. Uh, we had never adjusted uh, our paradigms uh, and that therefore we were still looking at what was being produced in those other territories by those other cultures uh, under those different circumstances and still we were cherishing this kind of one model uh, that nobody else could, could ever achieve. So we had a kind of very bizarre relationship with, with the world because we could all only say, well, it's not like us. Uh, and it's not as beautiful as we were. Uh, and therefore, I tried to, uh, simply to, to kind of readjust that, that kind of situation. And so, so by one model, you mean the traditional Western, Western street-oriented yeah. city, that, uh, that the, the sort of Jane Jacobs model, we might almost say, uh, of the yeah, lively. Yeah, 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 as an American, you could say Jane Jacobs, uh, okay. or you could also uh, uh, say Hausman or, or right. anybody else. Okay. And in Venice, uh, one of the things that f was for me very, very important is to look at elements also uh, of other cultures. And, and therefore, we have a kind of analysis, for instance, how 
the Chinese uh, uh, designed roofs in the 11th century uh, uh, according to which formula? Uh, and in, initially we thought that meant Chinese are not kind of original, but uh, as we translated the kind of literature more and more, we discovered that actually they were dealing with incredibly modern uh, phenomena like uh, corruption, kind of uh, value engineering, etc., and that kind of basically embedded in that kind of thinking about uh, how elements should be constructed, there was a vast intelligence, uh, very often, even if it's a thousand years, still of uh, important relevance. And uh, what I'm kind of actually interested in, in seeing is whether there is a kind of combination of uh, combining digital intelligence with all those other forms of intelligence, or whether it means that you basically throw out uh, kind of everything as antiquated or, mm -hmm. or ancient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I felt that, that elements could be read almost both ways, mm -hmm. as both um, a valedictory, a farewell to traditional architectural elements, and also, at the same time, a plea to somehow connect it to, well, to this world. Well, if you looked at elements, there were different strands along the way that died off. Right? Yeah. There were certain yeah. things that continued and other things that died off. And it was just, it was interesting to watch the mm. evolution where things turned into other elements. Yeah. And so for me, right. you know, we're, we're at one, one point yeah. in time. What is it going to look like in 20 or 30 yeah. years? I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated yeah. to see what the collaboration looks like. And you know, the history of architecture has really always been a history of aesthetics being enabled by technology, right? I mean, from the flying buttress of the mm. Gothic cathedral. And then when it's superseded, it's gone. I mean, nobody does flying buttresses anymore, right? So uh, all the way through architectural history, it's been technology, the latest technology enabling some new aesthetic direction. Exactly. Risk, you know, risk takers, risk ta mm. taking clients mm. and architects, working mm. together with the technologists, putting things together. Some things stick, right? Mm. It's the CCTV uh, building, mm. right? That's an absolute CCTV. gorgeous. CCTV in Beijing, which I'm sorry, I wish we had an image of, uh, could not have been built 20 years ago, is that right? Or could it have been? No, uh, but, but the reason is not uh, technology per se, but it's uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the construction and the, the details of the construction could only be uh, calculated in time by current computers. Right. Simply, uh, the, uh, computers only 10, 12 years ago would have been too slow to in time calculate all the effects, all the kind of moments, all the conditions uh, inside that building. Well, even before that, I mean, it was in the 90s that Frank Gehry said that without uh, that computer, digital software, Bilbao could never have been built. Mm -hmm. so this is, you're saying one generation almost later, the same issue applies. But that confirms that at least sometimes architecture is at the cutting edge of technology even if it takes forever to build a conventional house. <laughs> well, we yeah. build more and more yeah. technology, and you know, I look at it from when we design a product. Mm -hmm. There's still a 12-month kind of window yeah. when we start yeah. a project yeah. to finish. And we'll put more and more technology in it every year, but it's still really that, that, that human design uh, process that needs to happen to, to, to have a great outcome. And I think that's just yeah. what it takes because you have to yeah. iterate. Even though we say it's a beta product, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of architecture, mm -hmm. you still must iterate and iterate to get to that point to keep it within the two-year kind of thing and work with all the governmental bodies and all the new uh, uh, energy uh, renewable policies and those kinds of things. So it's, it's interesting. What, um, tell me more for a minute about, and we're almost at time for questions, so any, if anyone has any, this is the moment to head toward the mics, but while we wait for that, uh, let me go back to the whole question of, of uh, the ultimate digital house, you guys collaborating on a new kind of architecture. How different would the rooms be? How different would, what, what would be different in my living room if I had this house? Well, well when we design our products, okay. I, 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 you know, people will come to me, why, why'd you even put a screen on it? Why'd you even put, why do you even have a device in the home? Why don't you just do everything from the phone? And I'm okay. like, well, wait a second. You have guests in your house. You mm. have children in your house. You have, you mm. know, elderly in your house. They're not always going to have a phone with them at all times, mm. and maybe you're, it's not even charged. You still need physical elements in the home. They could look slightly different. There's got to be a, a, a standard interface for these things. You just don't throw everything out. So you have to be able to blend. 
you know, and that's been part of our, my career is blending the old with the new and to allow people to move forward with not, not feeling trepidation that they're going to a whole new world and throwing everything out and don't understand it any longer. So I think there's going to be a blend in this collaboration. And I hope it's going to hide the technology, not to show it the way it is today, you know, in many ways. But you'll still have interface, physical interface. Will you have a whole different system of, of transmitting electrical power, say? Well, I, we eventually, know that there are eventually, much eventually, better yes. ways of doing electricity yeah. than 110 yeah. volts yeah. or yeah. 240 volts, uh, 50 hertz, 60 hertz. There are much better ways, high voltage ways for high current, for low current that, you know, you, you can't get shocked on. You can have better energy efficiency. Uh, DC power is really great. There's many technologies, but because we have so much infrastructure built around the appliances, the, the wiring systems, the contractors, everything, that it's hard to be able to adopt these things unless you go to an island or a, to a yacht or some new city that someone's willing to invest and bring all that technology is in. Is that happening anywhere? I know in labs it's happening. I don't know if it's happening in the real world. I think that uh, in one of the rooms in Venice is, is interesting because on one wall you see uh, 200 Victorian windows that are unbelievably intricate, beautiful, uh, delicate, decorated, uh, intelligent, uh, and uh, enabling a vast amount of different manipulations. And on the, uh, the other part of the room, you see uh, a typical contemporary aluminum window being tested to uh, uh, conform to the European norm. And basically what you see is in kind of just over 100 years, an unbelievable loss in terms of ingenuity, uh, variation, um, beauty presumably. Uh, but I hope it will be one of the effects of digital technology is not that it kind of reduces uh, kind of possibility, but it actually kind of expands Expansive. possibility and, and uh, that we can find a way to increase choice again in, in certain ways. I mean, that's, that should be a kind of pact. Absolutely. Absolutely. The idea of greater choice. No, not greater choice in, in, in the obvious way, but greater uh, investment in, uh, in, in creativity and in uh, alternatives, I would say. I mean, in your introduction to the elements uh, at Venice, you wrote, I thought very movingly actually, about recalling architectural elements from your childhood, from the apartment you grew up in, uh, the balcony, the image of the balcony I remember particularly strongly. Um, is it possible that if we begin to uh, forfeit certain kinds of physical elements in favor of digital ones, we could lose that sort of resonance in your memory, that degree of profound influence that, that architecture can have on your psyche? Mm, I, uh, you, you make it sound uh, kind of slightly more conservative than, uh, than okay. I meant it. And I think I was simply inventorizing all my first memories of these uh, okay. elements. And I think that uh, kids, whatever happens, they will always have first memories, whether it is over TV, uh, 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 over TV or a toaster. Of, so I don't think that will fundamentally change. It's not that I'm kind of worried that kind of somehow uh, what people are doing here will kind of flatten the world. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of simply wor worried that there is uh, an, uh, a focus on, on issues that in the end will kind of reduce our options, uh, reduce our appetite for adventure, reduce our appetite for, uh, I mentioned it in uh, Venice, tra transgression. Transgression. Uh, transgression, uh, right, <laughs> okay. I mean, it, in other words, is it possible that your house would know too much? We've talked a lot today, in, in the last oh, couple of days, about yeah, other, yeah. Yeah, and Rem, other panels. Rem said this in oh, that, Venice, that, is right. like, literally, all these systems are going to be talking to you, telling you what to do every day, right. and so you're going to conform to what the house is telling you to do, because it was programmed from some big brother somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I hope that's definitely not the case. What we want to do is give people much mm -hmm. more freedom, much yeah. more choice, but give them the information to make those choices. But it, it could happen, of course. Yes. It could happen, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Right, right. Um, just because inevitably, even if there's not a big brother situation, 
you, you do respond to what the device allows you to do, encourages you to, no, you no, to do in very it, subtle ways. Yeah, but that's right? what you have today. Right. Those yeah. devices, they might be dumb, but they're very limited as well. You can right. only do certain things with them. Sure. What we're seeing is much more creativity, much more flexible use of these things from wherever it is. Mm -hmm. The question is, is what is the feedback to you and what is it asking you to do? Yeah, but right. let's right. take a very uh, a stupid example. There are cars now uh, that basically uh, project the speed that you drive with uh, yep. in front of you. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I have to admit that I behave better with that kind of machine than, yes. than without it. But that's why I hate both the machine and myself for being su such a conformist. And so I think that there are, uh, <laughs> embedded in, in a lot of our stuff is the same you know, pressure yes, yes, yes. Uh, to conform. Uh, and I think that is, for me, cumulatively, uh, a, a very oppressive situation. And you told me uh, earlier today that you just driven an, a BMW i8. Mm -hmm. What did you think of it as a piece of design? No, I, I was uh, part of a jury oh, okay. uh, that had to uh, define the best car of the year uh, for Germany. And uh, it was uh, in a way eye-opening because uh, clearly the car industry is also engaging with the internet and, and yeah. therefore also going through the same uh, radical transformation and, and being on the cusp, you know, are we producing kind of guided robots uh, or are we uh, improving the, uh, the machine that, that we are familiar with? Uh, and, and so it's kind of very tragic because on the one hand you have the most unbelievable, fantastic, uh, incredible uh, sense of adventure behind mm -hmm. some of the steering wheels of sport cars that I cannot mention here, but uh, that really are deeply thrilling mm -hmm. uh, every second you drive them. And they're and, also a blend of technology uh, uh, yeah, and, yeah, the, yeah. and the old world and bringing efficiency in as well. Uh, and on the other right, hand, right. quasar robotic hideous capsules that, uh, uh, <laughs> that, that, that uh, probably will uh, deliver on their promise to deliver you to the destination uh, safely. Uh, and so my heart is clearly you know, on right. one side, uh, but I, th I hope that as we move on in this confrontation or in this uh, kind of intersection of the two worlds, we, we don't have to face these uh, dilemmas between kind of uh, danger and harmlessness, uh, but that we can kind of define more profound terms right. uh, uh, for our existential demands. And actually, the, the, the car industry is a very good example because right. it, at its best, it has not sacrificed the right. things that, right. that make your heart race faster. Sure, absolutely. Right. But there's so, a lot of times when you're sitting in traffic and your heart's racing very fast and you just wish, no. I right, could just right, do right. something else. Yeah, so, right, right. you know, I think okay. we all love, yeah. you know, we all love that feeling of freedom when you're driving yeah. a car. But 97% of the time, you really just are like, I got to get yeah. there and yeah. I, do, I would rather be doing something else right. than sitting right. in like, like being at home in your house playing with your, your technology. Something. 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 Okay, good, good. <laughs> okay. Please join me in thanking Tony Fidel and Rem Koolhaas. Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you.